Ayan. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the latest Ethics Cuppa Club. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely almost spring-like day out there today. Uh, my name's Josh Brewer, I'm the Senior Business Development Manager here at Ethics. And today I'm really pleased to be joined by Bex Trevelyan, Emma Shaw and Sophia Wyatt, from who are the founders and directors of Library of Things. Hi guys. And I'm also joined by Keith Fredericks, and Patricia Catanese, who are directors of Stroud Microdairy. Thank you. So just give a little background. Hi, guys. No background. So Library of Things are, are currently running an EIS eligible equity offer on the FX platform um, to expand and grow their highly innovative social enterprise that enables people to affordably rent out useful items from local spaces and in the process reduce waste and the associated emissions. And Stroud Microdairy are a community benefit societies issuing withdrawable shares through FX. And this is to enable the community to, to own a sustainable dairy farm that uses regenerative and ethical farming methods to produce raw milk products for the local area. So two really interesting organizations today. Um, so the aim of the session today is really to learn just a bit more about what these organizations do, the vision they have, why what they do is important. Um, and it's important to note that it's not a financial promotion. Um, we're not able to answer any questions about individual circumstances. Uh, there's a chat function you can see if you uh, um, open that up or down the right hand side. If you've got any questions, just drop them in there. What I'll do is I'll try and feed those into the conversation as we go along, work them in. Or if I don't, if I can't work them into the conversation, then just we'll come to them at the end. Um, we are recording this. Um, we'll upload a recording of the webinar to our YouTube channel, the website, so you can watch it again or share it. And we'll send a follow-up email with links to any resources we might discuss. Um, the session should be no longer than 45 minutes, but if it's a really dynamic discussion, we might go a little bit longer. Okay. Well, I think time to hear a bit more about, about uh, Library of Things and Stroud Microdairy. So Keys and Patricia, could, uh, could you guys start me off and just tell me a bit more about what you do and why you do it? You certainly can. Hi, my name is Case Fredericks. I'm uh, the founder and, and now co-director of uh, Stroud Micro Dairy Co-op. Um, we are a community-owned raw milk dairy that practices regenerative agriculture. It was founded in 2017 uh, in a pub with a presentation and 40 people waiting for milk. And the idea then was um, we've got some, find some way of healing land and uh, not just reuse, reuse and um, regenerate and all that kind of stuff. Um, we need some way of taking carbon out of the air and putting it in the ground. We're doing it in such a way where the community is involved as well, um, because without it, it's not going to happen. And that's where we started. We started with a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture Scheme. We were the first dairy CSA in the country. And where we've evolved to now is the first community owned dairy co-op in the country. Uh, Principle is the same. And uh, the people who eat and the people who produce should meet each other roughly halfway and and talk to each other and 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 know each other and we have about 300 families that collect from us on a weekly basis they collect raw milk raw kefir yogurt bread eggs and other bits and that funds the land healing the community engagement and obviously the wages of the four people involved so that's us in a nutshell Thanks for that, Keith. That's, that's yeah, that's a great little overview of what it is that you want to do and 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 what your vision is. Um, so over to Library of Things, and I'm just going to refer to Bex, Emma, and Sophia as Library of Things going forward, if that's okay with you guys. That works for us. Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm Bex, and one of the co-founders of Library of Things. We're a social enterprise that helps people to save money and reduce waste by affordably renting out useful items. So items like drills, sound systems and sewing machines, we make them available for a few pounds a day from local spaces like libraries. 
and uh, we'll tell the story about how it works and show some images to, to bring it to life. Uh, but first, yeah, let's hear from Emma and Sophia, who are co-founders. Hi everyone, yeah, I'm Emma. My background is in environmental science and public sector innovation, and I've loved creating business ideas since I was at school. And for me, Library of Things is that one idea that really stuck and just deserves to live in the world, and that's what we do. Uh, so I lead on developing our healthy regenerative business model and a governance model that holds us accountable to our social mission as we grow. Hello everyone, I'm Sophia. I'm the third of the three co-founders. It's great to be a three. Um, I lead on the product and so I'm really motivated with the rest of the team to make an experience, create an experience that's actually better um, than buying, make borrowing better than buying. And we can definitely go into more about what that looks like. Uh, previously, I was doing strategy and service design for the likes of IKEA and KPMG. So translating a lot of those um, those things into Library of Things. And I lead on the partnerships for Library of Things, building partnerships with grassroots networks, with councils, with product manufacturers. We'll say more about that shortly. And my background is building grassroots movements and sustainable local enterprises around high streets in South London. And Library of Things, much like Stroud Microdairy, it started in the pub, it started in cafes, it started in libraries. Uh, meeting up as a group of friends and neighbours to say, hey, let's let's make it easier to borrow useful items rather than buying them from Amazon, from Argos and, and throwing them away six months later when they break. And that really has informed our mission, um, which is to make borrowing better than buying for people and planet. So I'm just sharing my screen. Can someone let me know that they can see that? OK. Great. And here's some photos of some happy people borrowing items. Um, we've, over the last seven years, uh, reached about 5,000 people in London borrowing items. We've only really been a, a social enterprise doing this kind of full time for the last three years. Uh, before that, it was a, a kind of a grassroots experiment and, and, uh, and movement. So that's the mission we started because consumerism isn't working for individuals. When we started, we had we were living in small flats and houses didn't have space to store bulky things, didn't have income to spend on stuff we just needed now and then. Uh, consumerism isn't working for communities. Our high streets need fresh ideas. And obviously it's not working for the planet. We're using three and a half times the kind of what the planet can sustain in the UK. We're consuming at that rate. And actually the UK is the second biggest producer of electronic and electrical waste worldwide. So we need to do things differently. And we've developed Library of Things really as a platform to make borrowing better than buying everywhere. So more affordable, convenient and higher quality. That's really important to us. More socially rewarding for communities and, and as we've said, kinder to the planet. And so the way it works is really simple. Um, we've built our technology to make it really easy to get a book uh, from about 50 things. Everything from drills to sewing machines to sound systems things that you only need every now and then. And then you can reserve online, come into your nearest uh, kiosk, which might be in your local library or high street, and uh, pay by the day. So for instance, it's eight pounds to borrow a drill for the day. And then you just return it whenever you're done. Move on back. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's, much, it's about much more than borrowing. It's and the tools in a place. Um, really what we're manage, managing to do is unlock local movements. Um, it's shifting consumer habits all across the UK and um, moving people towards reuse and repair. So when you're joined, you're part of the community and you can come along to repair parties and skill sharing events as well. And we've been doing this for about five years. So we really know our borrowers, and they are mostly living within uh, a mile, about 80% of them live within a mile of their local kiosk. And they broadly fit into these three groups of being people with growing families, or they've recently moved to the area. And sometimes they're also socially isolated. And, um, but what they're all kind of very motivated by is the affordability and the convenience of borrowing and doing something positive for their community and planet. 
So with 5,000 people having already used Library of Things, we've saved about 50 tonnes of waste from going to landfill so far. Um, today, really excited to open our eighth Library of Things in London in partnership with um, local spaces and bringing in 25,000 plus people to those spaces to use Library of Things that wouldn't have otherwise visited. Um, and one of the things we're most proud of is finding a, a way to work with councils to bring Library of Things to new neighbourhoods um, and being an off the shelf option for them to use climate action and environmental waste prevention budgets that they hold. Um, and partnering up with the best quality manufacturers we can find like Bosch and Karcher and Steel, who supply our products, our drills and the gardening tools and those kinds of things, um, as well as having backing from Innovate UK and the European Climate Kick. Uh, as, as we mentioned before, so um, growing, growing the service and our operations in London uh, is the visible stuff, but what we're really um, passionate about is this governance model. So as a social enterprise, holding ourselves accountable to our social mission, especially as we're growing. Um, and we do that uh, in a number of ways. One is to, we have a guardian share, a bit like a golden share, which is like an ultimate safeguard on the social mission. And the other is that all of our stakeholders, so our investors, our team, borrowers, partners, commit to putting the mission first. Um, so far, we've unlocked three revenue streams. The first is setup fees, so we're paid to bring Library of Things to a new neighbourhood. The second is that every borrower that comes to the platform, so the item rental fees, um, each kiosk can earn up to £25,000 a year. And with thousands of people using the platform, one of our most valuable resources is the kind of data and insight that we're gathering around borrowing behaviour, and that's valuable to corporates as well as universities interested in the growing circular economy. Um, and with the, the fundraise that we're currently doing, we'll unlock three new revenue streams, uh, impact sponsorship, franchise fees and license fees. We have a, a few more slides, but we'll, we'll just rattle through these because, um, yeah, we'll keep it snappy and save time for questions. But basically, the plan for this fundraise is to grow from nearly 10 London sites now to 50 nationwide uh, in partnership with councils and communities and then many more beyond that. The next couple of years are about testing out this franchise model to work with community entrepreneurs in cities beyond London. And then we're, we've had 400, over 400 requests from around the UK for, for help to set up in different places. So we're, we're hopeful that this model can, can grow and live in many, in many communities um, beyond 50. We've also had some interest from the States, from France, from Spain in, in growing there, but we're setting our sights on, on the UK for now. Um, the franchise model, we're, take, we're taking that approach through co-design with those communities we, we've talked about and the likes of Alice and Lucy, who are Cambridge residents who want to start this and are just like, you've already done the hard work in setting up the technology and the systems, but we want to start it where we are. And so let's partner. So that's our approach. And we have a really great team already in place to help deliver this. Uh, there's a, about 16 of us, this is just some of our um, leads. And the one just to draw out on franchising is Sanjit Singh, who grew uh, the Body Shop franchise across the UK and then the US. So it's a, it's a great group of people and uh, actually an award-winning workplace. So. A nice graph. I'll just say, you know, this is the financial story, so we can go into this in, um, another time. Um, but the idea is with 50 libraries of things on the platform, we are a self-sustaining, profitable, um, self-sufficient company from 2024. Um, and so the, the, the fundraising we're currently doing is in order is basically to deliver those plans. So to de develop our technology, develop a, a training program to find quality partners and to deliver that, um, that, that growth that we, uh, to fulfill the demand that we have. Um, the amount that we're raising through FX is a 300K minimum, and that's part of a bigger round. So we would love to love to and open to over raising through the FX audience, um, looking for investors who yeah, put our mission first really, and want to create long-term value for people and planet. And there's a final slide to, to leave on, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up there. Back to you, Josh. Thanks, guys. Um, that, 
really good overview of the of the business and actually we've actually had a couple of questions come in from from penny shepherd i think the the franchise aspect of it is is i think a, a very interesting piece actually because it's enabled enable you to scale and grow and, and and you know broaden that impact so um so the question from penny is so firstly how are you different from commercial hire shops and then there's a follow-up question wanting to know just a bit more information about franchising so when are you going to move when are you going to get started a little bit more about your requirements and do you have a franchise in sussex happy to take those yeah really good questions thanks penny the we're different from commercial tool hire in three ways i guess one is about audience a lot of our users over the years have said we don't we don't go into hss tool hire for example they're not that's not for me it's often for tradespeople. Um, we work a lot more with kind of people who just need items, tools around the house, the garden, the community project. Um, so that's that's one thing. We do a lot of work to make it a kind of super friendly user journey and not intimidating with how to guides and um, making it really accessible for everyone. A second, the second way we're different is is affordability. Um, Sophia made, mentioned eight pounds a day for it's all, all of our power tools, all of the pressure washers, uh, steam cleaners, things like that. And um, and it, there's a dis, there's a discount for people who are less able to pay as well. On top of that, there are discounts weekly. There are discounts if you refer friends. And we yeah we're ever trying to work to make it super affordable to take away barriers to borrowing. Um, I guess the third the third reason is the is the community movement and impact story. That's that's not HSS tool tool hires brand or approach right. We work in partnership with grassroots groups, transition towns, mutual aid groups. Um, we facilitate skill sharing. We did two years of repair parties, DIY classes pre-pandemic. It's our ambition to do that again. Um, I, I hope that I hope that answers that bit of the question. So the second part was um, where franchise and when and what are the requirements? So we've lined up three pilot franchise partners. Um, one is in Cambridge, as I mentioned. One is in Brighton. One is in Peterborough. And Really, for each franchise partner, we, we're looking for three ingredients. One is um, kind of entrepreneurial local people who want to drive it, who have about a day a week over about 12 months to, to make this happen. So local people with time, skills, energy. The second ingredient is a, a host space, um, and we can very much help find that, but a, a space to host a library of things. The third ingredient is a council that's on board and supportive. Again, part of our offer is to facilitate that relationship with the council. So the, the main thing we're looking for is those engaged entrepreneurial local people, bit of a track record of, of doing community projects and, and having local networks. Um, when will we be ready? Well, the first, uh, we're hoping to get the first pilot going in autumn this year. Depends on our partners' timelines and, uh, and readiness, but that's the hope. And, from now, you can express interest via our website. I'll put the link in the chat um, if you want to know more about partnering. Great, Thank, thanks for that, Bex. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the one of the really interesting things about being at Ethics is being able to work with a really wide range of organisations. And, and I think, you know, just looking at Stroud Micro Dairy and looking at Library of Things, you're 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 very different in in a lot of ways. But there is a kind of there is a thread that runs through that I think is 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 similar, and that's around your kind of, you know, the 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 the, the extent to which community is really at the heart of what you do. And I suppose, Case, if I could just come across to you there, and and with Stroud Micro Dairy, is this sort of idea of building and strengthening communities? Is that is that something that's important to to your mission and to what you're trying to achieve? Sorry, you're on mute, Case. Um, thanks, Josh. Um, yes, um, the sense of community and building community is actually foundational. It, it also informs our business model. Um, in, in a very simple way, we are a glorified honesty box on a very large scale. Uh, all payments are electronic on a, on a subscription platform, but people have a code to the door. They collect what they paid for on the door day that they've chosen. Um, and and that honesty is responded and and the model works brilliantly and the reason it does is we are serving a community something that they want 
uh, and a place close to them, but also uh, we give them the trust and, and it's replicated to us. And that has really allowed us to grow from, you know, 40 people to over 300 now. And uh, all that income is unpoliced and it's done on faith and will continue to um, when we reach 600 uh, members in, in a couple of years time. Um, part of that, if you expand out beyond that, um, that's why also what we do is so important. We can't do it alone. Um, and uh, uh, like library things, they have an impressive list of stakeholders and you got to, uh, you need to work together with people. And um, in a community, there's not only the people that buy your products, but also the people that need an outside space where they can see food produced and that's reachable and uh, accessible we we back onto stroud the houses pop up just across the fence people can walk to come and collect their raw milk um as opposed to milk being shipped for 300 miles down to one processor only for it to be shipped 300 miles back up to your local store um so yeah it's really really important and it's one of the things that informs our governance model so we've chosen for a multi-stakeholder co-op. What a sense that means for us is we're a workers co-op. So the people that work in their day-to-day -day, um, do most of the driving, but the other stakeholders have kind of a third and a third stake so that we can get this local community in influence on it in a very strong way. And then people who are a little further afield would want to help us because they want to see it in their own town, to get a say too. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I think that's a really key thing because I was going to ask that to the extent to which you feel like what you do is replicable. Because obviously, what one of the things you're trying to do is 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 kind of make it for a better food system, you know, a more more efficient, lower impact food system, which which is local by nature. But obviously, then you need a whole load of Stroud micro dairies all over the place. So how, how to what extent do you feel you are replicable, and and are you supporting other organizations to, to, to try and develop that, that the kind of thing that you're doing? In short, yes, we are replicable. And uh, it may not be uh, um, in direct kind of contact with Stroud Minecraft area. There's lots of them that come and we spend a day with them and inspire them and get them set up and we help where we can. Um, and there are more micro dairies springing up all the time. Um, I guess what we are doing here in, at Stroud Micro Dairy is actually consolidating all of what we've learned over the last four years, uh, being the first CSA dairy in the country, you know, the first community owned dairy co-op. And, and in that will come the formulas and standardized work processes that require the infrastructure and the expenditure that we're seeking for other people to copy. Great. In this case, now I've got, I had a question come in, um, which I'm going to come to in a minute. I, just while we're talking about governance, I did just want to come back to, to library of things because you, you've got, I mean, you've, you've talked about it there, your guardian share, but I think you're quite unusual in that you are a with profits business that has this guardian share. And I'm just wondering, have you found that that's helped you or, or hindered you or a mixture of the two? Uh, helped um, in terms of, you know, what we exist to do is to fulfill our mission to make borrowing better than buying for people on the planet. And we realized in, in making borrowing happening that happened that we needed to kind of slightly tweak capitalism in a way. Um, so we're talking about fundraising and um, we needed to find the right kind of investors and partners who were with us for the long term, who understood what we were trying to achieve and not pull against that. Uh, so, you know, for our, our community to us is quite a broad term. It means our borrowers, it means our partners, it means our investors, it means the planet too. And we're, we're very clear that everyone should be pulling in that, in that direction of putting the mission first. So yes, we can make profit, but it's not the reason we exist. Um, and the, the Guardian share is quite an elegant way of doing that. Um, it's not a brand new thing. Um, golden shares have existed for a long time. So 
the government holds a golden share in Rolls Royce, for example, because it's of strategic importance to the country. And our guardian share is the absolute safeguard that we stay true to our mission and we can be held accountable to our borrowers, our partners and others um, who, who, have a, who have real power too. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of, um, it felt important to us that the, the culture that we create as a company is always rooted in those that it impacts the most who have the most stake in the company. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Um, Case uh, or Patricia, I just get, there's a couple of questions coming around animal welfare. Uh, and so I'm just going to read the question out. Uh, and so can you explain your approach to calf weaning versus standard agricultural practice? And also is semen sexing a practical solution for the problem of unwanted male calves? Or do you plan to rear on, sell them on for veal or fattening? And then there's another sort of question, which I think is related, which is what happens to the calves after three months with, with the mother? Um, yeah, I, I might answer that. Um, uh, what we do, um, oh, first off, industry standard um, for weaning is normally uh, between two hours and a couple of days to a week. Um, and they basically are taken from mum or snatched at birth and fed uh, milk colostrum. Um, what we do is we keep them on with the mums for three months. There's a staggered process. They're with their mums for the first four to six weeks for uh, 24 hours a day, the whole time, unrestricted access. And, uh, and after the six, initial six weeks, we actually have a calf pen where we uh, reduce that down to once a day. Um, and this does a couple of things. It actually makes calf at foot micro dairying feasible uh, because otherwise you have uh, the equivalent of teenagers running all around the way and the amount of labor you lose <laughs> in chasing after calves becomes a bit onerous. Um, but also what it does is it allows the calves a little bit of independence and to um, be able to develop their um, rumen and digestion a, a little bit faster. So when the three months comes of age, uh, it's all well and good having mum for three months, but if there's a short, sharp separation, uh, then not only is it mostly quite hard, but it's actually um, physiologically uh, quite hard for them as well. So they go backwards for a couple of weeks. And our system, this blend actually avoids that. Um, what I will say with um, kind of calf at foot and ethics and stuff like that is um, there's always a separation. Unfortunately, you can't get around. In fact, it's a good thing. It means that the calf and mother have had a chance to develop a bond and, 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 and allow to express that. Um, and uh, what we do is we have a staggered uh, weaning period of a, a couple of days where the mums get to learn that the calf is in the same place where they are tomorrow. And um, there's kind of a training element to kind of reduce any um, stress or anxiety around the first weaning stage. And at the second weaning stage, they're a lot more independent and there's a, there's a lot less stress on both mum and calf for that. Um, what happens afterwards uh, is, unfortunately, we are biodynamic and we're calf at foot and we put an awful lot of love into those calves up to three months. And, but we can't do it all. So they go to local beef farmers um, for uh, a lot less than we should be charging, to be honest. The market doesn't really pay for organics uh, with uh, young stock. Um, we work together with a couple of local farmers, the local CSA, which is great. Uh, they're the, the oldest CSA in the country, so we support them. And there are a couple of farmers that farm in a very low intensive way that we like. Uh, we would like to do veal. Uh, it really depends on members. We have a co-op and they have a say. What that would do would allow us to actually uh, fund the raising of all the females uh, to become replacements and, and live the life of a herd. Um, um, because um, having an ethical approach to calves does cost money. You have to find some way of finding it. And this is what we, and veal is one of the things that we're looking at. 
Okay. Thanks, Case. And again, this is about developing localized food systems rather than mass production food systems. Um, I just, I mean, we've got a, we've got a lot of things that we're facing at the moment, but I think climate change is one that is going to be with us for, for well, certainly for the foreseeable future. Um, and I'm just a little bit interested to find out from both the organisations how how what you do, you know, seeks to mitigate or tackle that that problem. Um, and so maybe if I turn over to Library of Things to, to start off with there. Yeah, I'm happy to talk a bit to that. Um, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose our approach is, um, is twofold. So one is to prevent purchases from happening in the first place. So if there is an alternative, a genuine, local, affordable, convenient alternative to buying something from Amazon or Argos, then uh, that becomes a, an available behaviour pe for, for people to use. So you can start borrowing rather than buying. Um, and as a result of fewer things being purchased, but also then ultimately things would be, end up being thrown away, there's uh, emissions associated with landfill or the way electrical products are currently um, handled, which there's a lot of I suppose, activism around, for example, with the right to repair and other kind of movements and legislation like that, which will over time only increase the burden on product manufacturers to design things for repairability, durability, um, and that's really, I guess, our long play is how should, at the moment, we're selective about the products that we provide because they are the best for borrowing. They are the most suitable ones we've found in terms of quality and repairability. But we would like to see more product manufacturers making things, you know, suitable for borrowing and sharing, but also able to be repaired rather than just thrown away and kind of cut the single use product um, culture, which, yeah, we feel is, you know, the kind of Attenborough effect with plastics a lot of awareness about that the electrical industry is dark and dirty and dangerous and all of those things and there's a, a lot less public awareness about that at the moment but it, it will only increase um, with a mix of legislation and campaigning I think. I, I think that's one of the interesting things actually is because I mean just in terms of your partnerships with with companies because in some ways you know what you do undercuts their business model as it currently stands you know, it's which which is very much to produce things which uh, need to be replaced in one, two, three years, whatever it might be. Do, do you sense there's a genuine commitment to trying to develop, you know, more sort of long term products, that high quality products that, that that you know work in the kind of way that you're you're trying to trying to uh, you know disseminate? Yes, I think that I think there is. There's we found. We found at Bosch, Karcher and Steel that there is senior leadership buy-in to the circular agenda. They know we've reached peak stuff. They know that increasingly it's a legal obligation on them to design for durability. Um, the EU laws came in around planned obsolescence. Um, so they know it's important and they see library of things as a way to find out how they can improve their, their products. So we're telling them, did you know that this part of the steam cleaner always breaks it or this is a this is a bit of the pressure washer you need to make more robust so that's that's what we are sharing with them in exchange for discounts and donations um, of products okay great that, that, that would be that would be a, a systems change wouldn't it if we can get <laughs> manufacturers to start start thinking in that way um okay so just like to uh, push push the same question across to you i think i, I think when most people think about dairy herds or, or beef production you, you know the, the 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 sort of climate change case against it is 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 brought up you know so there's a lot of emissions involved with that process um how is it that what you do is different you know how, how do you actually kind of mitigate that and offset that in in the way that you work at Stroud Micro Dairy um well first off I might set a bit of context um I was actually quite sympathetic to that view <laughs> until I read uh, a book called Carbon Fields by Graham Harvey which set me on this task because I thought I was never going to be a dairy farmer again I'm a dairy farmer so um and what uh, what that concept showed was if you um herbivores and grasses have evolved for millennia in order to build soils and um, pull carbon out of the air. And the amount of herbivores on grasslands before we started was actually higher than it is now when they're in feedlots. Now this argument is more towards the US 
UK has a better climate for uh, growing grass, to be fair. Um, so if we do things um, the right way, we can actually have a net neg uh, positive outcome in terms of carbon sequestration. And this includes methane. And that's what we're trying to achieve at Stroud and Micah Dairy. And the reason why this is possible is because grasses actually depend on herbivores. You don't get the same result from just growing grass or growing wheat and just cultivating because a lot of the carbon oil burns up in the atmosphere. If you want to store it, trap it and keep it there in a, an ecosystem that is quite widespread in the UK, uh, you need animals in order to store that. And uh, so a lot of our carbon emissions are offset by the increase in carbon that uh, we uh, anticipate we are storing right now. We've got a baseline or we're halfway through our uh, setting up our baseline. And um, like all long terms, that'll take three to four years before we have a definitive answer. But the research is there that that is the case. Um, the question is uh, how, uh, how well is that carbon stored over the long term? And in any kind of carbon, where the carbon market is here, in any route that you go down, uh, that question is an answer, yes, and it's the same for us. However, we are trying to reduce what we, our impact in the here and now as well. Uh, probably 90% of what we do goes in reusable, reusable glass. Uh, we use, in terms of tractor usage, is a fraction of what we have on normal, um, normal farms. And uh, because we are so localized, there's a lot less transport in there as well. So if you bring those all together, um, and you end up with a positive number, that's amazing. That's, uh, well, that's what we all need. Great, thanks, Case. Um, someone's just asked what the name of the book of, again, please. Could, do you want to just drop that in the chat and then people can... I will do, yeah. Um, I have to say that that book was 10 years ago when I started down that rabbit hole. So there's probably loads of books since then, but I will drop it in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess... Um, Okay, we've got a question saying at the moment we have a Hereford bull, so all the calves go to local beef. Okay, that's right, that's from UK. So, okay, apologies. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I think one of the interesting things about both both of your organisations actually is, you know, library of things, you're, you're very much a, a female-led organisation, female founders, and, and actually, uh, you know, Stroud Microdairy, although we've got Case as the face of Stroud Microdairy, I believe you have a majority of female directors at the organisation as well. Um, what are the sort of face any challenges with that or do you think that's you know the advantages that you find of being female led uh, i throw that across the library things first i mean i'm happy to ask your point of view of culture because i think it's created a, a really wonderful kind of quite nurturing and facilitative culture um but that's not to say that that's because we're just women it's just the yeah that come out of us being female-led. Um, but I know that there's been some challenges in terms of uh, investing uh, that I'm sure Em can speak to a little bit more. Well, yeah, the other is, you know, a lot of what we, a lot of the products we have, not exclusively, but a lot of the products are DIY. So when we first started, the three of us um, bought an old shipping container that we turned into our first library of things and painted that and, you know, sourced all the plywood and all of that and going into HSS Hire and Travis Perkins and running a DIY business and all of that was um we got some annoying kind of comments and yeah, yeah about that um and then I suppose yeah another kind of sharp experience that we didn't expect was when we first went out to raise some funding to build our technology this is nearly three years ago um and to help us get London borrowing and um, didn't know that about 1% of um, funding in startups goes to women-led teams. So a tiny, tiny fraction, one P in every pound, basically. It's a huge kind of, again, fairly quite, quite hidden systemic issue, which there is now, even within the three years that we've, um, since we've been fundraising, seen some change with the Women Investment Code, um, with much more awareness, I suppose. But I think that, again, it's a cultural point, the culture of running a business and, if you need fundraising uh it it doesn't feel inclusive um not just for women but for the kind of non silicon valley shiny um company sometimes 
Yeah. I'll, add a, I'll add a final point that Emma won't won't mention, but she, that there has been a fund by Innovate UK for the last few year, few years called Women in Innovation, and Emma applied kind of last minute all night her application and uh, was successful from 850 applicants down to 40. So there are funds out there and uh, that are specifically addressing this issue and trying to create new role models, and we're we're excited to be to be able to be those role models for younger younger women. I mean, I think that's in, in in terms of what ethics is trying to achieve as well. I think that's a, 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 one of the things we're trying to address. We're, we're a female led organization. Um, the, the numbers of um, women investors we have on the platform is much, much higher than most of kind of angel networks. And if you look at the, the businesses, we have a very high proportion of sort of women led organizations as well. So hopefully we can be part of that infrastructure to try and try and drag investment into the 21st century. Um, okay, so it's, it's interesting that, uh, that you have um, a majority female directors. Again, I'm, I mean, I don't know too much about the dairy industry, but I, I had a sense that maybe it was a fairly male dominated world. Is that, is that right? Uh, yes, it is very male dominated. In fact, uh, farming generally is. Uh, and um, I think all but one hire that I've ever done over the five years has been female. Uh, and my first hearse manager was uh, a vegan as well. So um, it, it, you put the job description out there and the best person who applies gets it. And in my case, uh, yeah, they were all female and, and power to their elbow. I'm very lucky. Um, and uh, and now, as a co-op with uh, three directors on on out of four being female, um, yeah, it's pretty much female-led now as well. Um, uh, I'm the face, I'm the founder, but um, it's 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 now a um, a devolved kind of say, uh, and that's great. There's more resilience in it. Uh, there's more expertise in it, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so just going to got, got time for think for one more question, although hopefully yeah. it's not really detailed <laughs> in depth that you have to go into. But um, how does the micro dairy continue to sequester sequester carbon after the in soil carbon in the pasture has reached a plateau? Isn't the positive impact just compared to the even worse mainstream dairy? Um, thanks for asking it because I was trying to kind of write it out. It's probably easier to say. Um, in short, by going deeper. So uh, UK soils are on average about six centimeters deep. It's tiny, tiny compared to the meters that they could go down. Um, you know, some, some of our plants in diverse pastures, they have the ability to go five, 10 meters deep. Now, it's not gonna be five, 10 meters deep anywhere. But if you compare five, six centimeters with going down a meter, you've got decades, if not hundreds of years of sequestration to do before you hit a plateau. So, um, and this was really, uh, if you're looking for YouTube references for it, um, the, there's uh, somebody in Denmark did uh, um, some interesting grazing techniques with uh, um, ripping up the soil underneath to allow the roots to go down. And he's managed to change the color, which is an indication of carbon down to 75 centimeters from five centimeters in the space of three years. And to fill it all up takes an awful long time, but hey, if you can get down 75 centimeters in three years uh, and make a start, that's, uh, it just shows you how big the piggy bank is and, and how much scope we've got. Great, thanks Case. I'm, I'm conscious of time um, and just to kind of wind up, I, I guess it'd be great if I could just have, you know, both both organisations, if you could get someone to take, who's watched this today, to take one thing away about your organisation, what what would that be? And I'll, I'll pass that across the library of things. So maybe you've got three things. I don't know, there's three of you, but yeah. <laughs> maybe they'd be the same, maybe they'd be different. Sorry, who would like to start? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we're looking at each other. Um, if you could take one thing away. Yeah, I guess this started as a movement. It continue, it's continuing as a movement and it's about to go big. 
Brilliant. Fantastic. And, and Case? Um, that uh, what you, you see remotely in Stroud Micro Dairy now should really happen in your locality tomorrow. So, you know, invest with us, make it happen here in Stroud, and then see the same thing down the road from you tomorrow. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yes, I think that's the key thing, isn't it? Replicability, rolling these things out. That's that's how we make how we make change, that system change there. Listen, that's been a really, really great conversation. I've enjoyed that. And, and uh, hopefully the, the audience have found that really useful. Um, so it just remains to say thank you to the guys at Library of Things. So thank you, Emma and Bex and Sophia. And uh, thank you over to the guys at Stroud Micro Dairy as well, Case and um, Patricia, who's, who's left us now. It's great. I've really enjoyed it. Um, just to say to everyone, there'll be a follow-up email with links to information we discussed on the webinar webinar will be available to download from, from the FX website. So I just say, uh, yeah, finish up there. Enjoy the rest of your days, everyone. And, and thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, thanks Josh. Everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.